With their menacing dark silhouettes belching fire and smoke, the ironclad warships of the mid-19th century burst upon the naval scene like hulking metal monsters. Combining armor plating, steam propulsion, and the biggest, most powerful guns afloat, the ironclads represented a radical advance over all earlier warships, making the wooden navies of the world obsolete overnight and paving the way for the battleships of the 20th century. During the American Civil War, ironclad river and coastal craft represented the South's best hope of smashing the strangling federal blockade of its coastline. Desperately seeking an answer to these Confederate superweapons, the Union placed its hopes in a revolutionary new design, proposed by an eccentric, volatile genius named John Erickson the USS Monitor. Essentially an armored steam-powered raft on an iron hull, the Monitor measured 179 feet long and 41 and a half feet wide. Her deck stood a mere 12 inches out of the water. Her armor consisted of five layers of one-inch iron plate. But the Monitor's single most influential innovation was its revolving turret enabling a 360-degree field of fire for its two 11-inch guns. The ironclad's many innovations received their trial by fire in some of the most decisive naval battles of the Civil War. The eyes of the world watched these clashes anxiously, for more than the fate of the Union was at stake. The victors of the first contest between armored ships would spawn a revolution in warship design that would profoundly affect every naval power in existence. Although the earliest and most famous battles between ironclads took place during the American Civil War, Yankee and Confederate engineers were far from the first to consider using armor to protect their ships. As long ago as the 10th century, Viking shipwrights built a vessel named the Ironbeard that had its bow sheathed in iron plates. But it wasn't until the dawn of the Industrial Age in the 19th century that armoring warships became practical on a large scale. One of the first of this new generation was Great Britain's HMS Warrior, which was commissioned in 1861. With her sleek black iron hull riding high in the water and powered by sails as well as steam, the warrior had more in common with the wooden warship she was designed to replace than the American Monitor, which would make its appearance a mere six months later. The warrior was, however, a revolutionary warship with a hull made of one-inch thick iron plates and her main gun deck housed in an armored box or citadel protected by four and a half inches of wrought iron bolted to 18 inches of wooden backing. This is the armored citadel of the vessel. And uh, these iron ships were made like a large armoured rectangle with a sharp bit on the front being the bow and the rounded stern. To protect the gun's crew, then they placed the armour on the outside of the gun deck and allowed them to be safe when firing these weapons. Along with her state-of-the-art armour, Warrior was also equipped with the most advanced armament of its day. This particular weapon is a 68 pound muzzle loading smooth bore. This could fire a projectile three miles and uh, could do considerable damage, to, especially to a wooden vessel. On this particular weapon, we used formulated mercury, which was in a tube, which was placed in the touch hole. The top was bent over and then the hammer was cocked and the thing was fired from using a firing lanyard. <laughs> Bang and it flashed straight down into the main charge and sent the projectile in its way rejoicing. Under sail or steam, Warrior was capable of the then extraordinary speed of 14 knots. Using a combination of the two, the vessel was known to reach a top speed of 17 knots. Despite her many innovative features, HMS Warrior was a product of the same tradition that produced warships like the Gathered, the frigate, and the mighty ship of the line. Built of wood and powered exclusively by the wind, 
these vessels had ruled the waves for centuries, leaving an heroic legacy that was personified in vivid characters like Sir Francis Drake and Admiral Horatio Nelson. Yet even as Nelson was winning his smashing triumph over Napoleon Bonaparte's fleet at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, the weapons that would write an end to the age of wooden walls were already being tested on French warships. These were shell guns, cannon that fired explosive projectiles as opposed to solid shot. If you take a solid shot, either rifled or not rifled, and you shoot at a wooden ship, you're going to literally have to splinter everything to sink a ship. If you use something that goes through and then explodes, you're going to wreak havoc inside that hull. You're going to kill men. You're going to destroy guns. You're going to destroy that ship's ability to fight. So the shell gun was absolutely crucial to this. By the mid-1800s, years of study and experimentation had led the French to a series of inescapable conclusions. The lethal effectiveness of shell guns, especially against wooden targets, would make them devastating weapons for naval warfare. And since only a ship armored with layers of iron plates would be tough enough to withstand shell fire, ironclad warships had to be developed. With the support of their emperor, Napoleon III, the French took an early lead in the race to build ironclads. With a fleet of ironclad warships, the emperor believed he could gain the edge in his nation's age-old rivalry with Britain for dominance of the seas. Actually, the Director General of Construction in the French Navy changed about that time, a chap called Depuy de Lerme, who is arguably probably the best naval architect during the 19th century. And he conceived this idea of building a ship with armored iron plate. And the Gloire, which he designed, was actually the first ironclad. Launched in 1859, Le Gloire combined iron plating with 36 shell-firing guns and supplementary steam power to produce a formidable warship. Once word of the French ship reached England, the reaction was immediate. Public opinion became very alarmed in this country because, of course, the British Empire was at its peak and it was important for us to keep the trade routes open. Prodded by the launch of Le Gloire, the British Royal Navy built HMS Warrior less than a year later. Sister ships of the Warrior and other new designs followed in quick succession. The British ironclads were even bigger, faster, and more powerful than the French. Comparing her directly with the Warrior, the Warrior was a totally new conception. It was a much longer ship, more stronger, heavily armored, heavily gunned, very maneuverable, very fast under both steam and sail and it was altogether a much superior ship. However, the relative merits of the rival iron juggernauts were never tested in battle. In fact, neither Le Gloire nor Warrior would ever fire their guns in anger. Dupuy de Lome had said that an encounter between an ironclad like Le Gloire and a squadron of wooden ships would be like turning loose a lion among the lambs. But it would be an American ironclad, not a European one that first demonstrated the terrible truth of that prediction. On January 9, 1861, Confederate gun emplacements on the South Carolina shore opened fire on Fort Sumter, just outside the entrance to Charleston Bay. The first shots fired in the American Civil War marked the beginning of a conflict in which control of the sea would play a vital role set the stage for a legendary naval duel that would forever change the character of combat at sea. A week after the surrender of Fort Sumter, President Abraham Lincoln imposed a federal blockade of the South's 3,000-mile coastline to cut the Confederacy's lifeline to her maritime trading partners. At the war's outset, the South had no real navy of its own and no real resources with which to build one. By April 24, 1861, however, rebel forces had captured Gosport Naval Yard at Norfolk, Virginia. In their haste to evacuate the massive shipyard, Union forces had abandoned not only their largest cache of heavy ordnance, but the surprisingly intact hull of a scuttled steam-powered frigate called the USS Merrimack. Secretary of the Confederate Navy, Stephen Mallory, 
then launched a bold and risky scheme to raise the Merrimack and convert it into an armored superweapon. And Mallory got to the nub of things right away. He recognized that if the South could come up with something new or different, present a different sort of naval threat, it would level the table somewhat. And the idea was ironclads. The partially destroyed steam frigate Merrimack at Norfolk offered a starting place because they could cut off the destroyed part and build on top of it. And that's what they did. Mallory commissioned shipbuilder John Porter to take on the transformation of the Merrimack's wooden hull. Because of their low technology and limited resources, they had to build a casement ship, one with sloping sides, and they could use pieces of railroad track for armor plating. Because except for the Tredegar ironworks in, in Richmond, the South had very little capability to create iron plating or any major ironwork like that. John Brook, an ordnance expert, installed 10 heavy shell-firing guns in the casement, which was armored with four inches of railroad iron and backed by two feet of sturdy southern pine and oak. Mounted on the bow like a giant dagger was the ship's most menacing feature, a 1,500-pound cast-iron prow for ramming enemy ships. On March 8, 1862, the Merrimack, now renamed CSS Virginia, steamed out of Norfolk to attack the Union ships positioned at a place called Hampton Roads, a shallow channel at the entrance to Chesapeake Bay. Her commanding officer, Commodore Franklin Buchanan, who had previously served 46 years in the U.S. Navy, was spoiling for a fight. After being underway for only 90 minutes, the strange craft steamed into the channel and came under heavy fire from three Union blockading vessels. She was an ironclad. They were not. It was the fox in the chicken coop. She had a field day. They fired at her, the shots bounced off the sides. What happened was absolute pandemonium. Pandemonium. Here comes this quote unquote ironclad monster steaming out of the Elizabeth River out in the Hampton Roads. And the first thing she does is steam right over to USS Cumberland and just rammed her with that armored prow. With a gaping hole in her port bow, the Cumberland sank quickly taking down almost half her crew of 376 men, along with the Virginia's iron ram, which had broken off and was still embedded in her side. The lion was among the lambs. During the chaotic melee, two Union frigates, the Congress and Minnesota, ran aground. The Virginia quickly reduced the Congress to a flaming hulk. A shot from her guns crippled another Union vessel. Only nightfall and the ebb tide saved the damaged and grounded Union warships. As the tide went out, the Virginia, with her deep draft, also risked running aground. After Buchanan was wounded during an earlier portion of the battle, command had shifted to Lieutenant Catesby Jones. Jones decided to call it a day and pointed the Virginia back upstream. He would return the next day and finish the job. The telegram bringing the news of the disaster at Hampton Roads struck Washington, D.C. with the force of a thunderbolt. Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells did his best to allay the fears of Lincoln's panic-stricken cabinet. He had just received word that the Union's new ironclad, USS Monitor, had arrived in Hampton Roads. He believed that John Erickson's strange little vessel, although untested in combat, was more than a match for the warship they still referred to as the Merrimack. Secretary of War Edwin Stanton was just as convinced that the Monitor, with only two guns, was no match for the proven deadliness of the Confederate Ironclad's 10. Furthermore, Stanton feared that after laying waste to the Union fleet, the Confederate doomsday weapon would steam up the Potomac to attack Washington, D.C. Not unlikely, he said. We shall have a shell or cannonball from one of her guns in the White House before we leave this room. In truth, the Monitor had characteristics that gave reason for both confidence and misgivings. She was a bit like her inventor, John Erickson. Eccentric, well ahead of her time, and extremely controversial.
Although exceedingly brilliant, the Swedish-born Ericsson was a volatile and impetuous iconoclast who could be his own worst enemy. Ericsson was known to the Navy because back in the late 1830s, it had been Ericsson who had helped put together the first propeller-driven steamer of the Navy, the Princeton. And Ericsson had also designed and produced the, the guns on the Princeton. Unfortunately, one of those guns exploded, killing the Secretary of the Navy and a number of others. And Ericsson was in some disrepute. Ericsson was really lambasted by the U.S. Navy, and he got angry. He uh, took his genius uh, approach and all his new ideas, and he went back to New York, and he said, forget it, people. I'm not going to deal with you ever again. But in the fall of 1861, when the Union belatedly launched its own ironclad program to counter the Confederate superweapon being built at Norfolk, Erickson put his old grudges aside. He submitted his plans for an armored vessel to the Navy Department's ironclad board, but was promptly rejected. Not only did Erickson's monitor dispense with sails, it looked like nothing they'd ever seen before. Some of the men doubted the vessel would even float. They instead decided to limit the ironclad program to two prototype designs with more traditional layouts. However, Erickson refused to take no for an answer. The day after his proposal was rejected, he met with the board and delivered a dazzling one-hour lecture, not only on the merits of his design, but also on his ability to build the vessel in the incredibly brief period of 100 days. The decision was unanimous. Erickson was ordered to start at once. With neither a comprehensive blueprint nor a scale model of the warship, Erickson worked feverishly, dashing off hundreds of drawings for the new vessel as needed. Its most novel feature was the way it carried its armament. Erickson's design was created to carry a weapon system first, and everything else was secondary to that. It was an excellent fighting machine. It had a gun turret. So instead of having a number of guns running down each side of the ship, you had a fewer number of guns in a central position, and you could turn that central position to aim the guns, the gun turret. It was revolutionary. 101 working days after the start of construction, the Monitor steamed out on its maiden voyage. Leaving New York Harbor for Hampton Roads on March 6, 1862, the Monitor's journey to rendezvous with its Confederate nemesis got off to an inauspicious start. Water leaked through ventilation pipes and poured in around the turret ring. Running into rough weather off the Delaware Capes, the new ironclad nearly capsized and sank twice. Designed to operate in shallow coastal waters and harbors, Ericsson's Monitor proved to be unstable on the open sea. And even on calm waters, the crews serving aboard the Monitor and later ships of her type found that their design made few concessions to comfort. Serving aboard a Monitor was rotten. Uh, these were crude ships. She had problems with ventilation down below, uh, both for the crew and to feed the engines, the boilers, the fireboxes. Uh, she had problems with condensation on the inside of the iron hull, making everything wet and moldy. It was rude and crude. Arriving in Hampton Roads after dark on March 8th, Commanding Officer Lieutenant John Warden anchored the Monitor near the stranded Minnesota. Warden and his crew knew that tomorrow would bring the first clash between ironclad warships in history. They were confident of a Union victory. But back in Washington, Secretary of War Stanton was not. He dashed off a series of telegrams to the governors of coastal states. Man your guns, block your harbors. The Merrimack is coming. At 8 a.m. on the morning of March 9th, a curl of black smoke appeared on the east side of Hampton Roads, rising from a shape some said resembled a floating barn roof. The CSS Virginia was crossing the channel heading straight for the USS Minnesota. When Virginia came out the next morning, as she was expected to do, at first all she saw were her old prey. And then suddenly this something appeared coming out from behind one of the ships. It was the Monitor. One Confederate observer exclaimed that the Union ironclad looked like a tin can on a shingle. 
The Virginia immediately opened fire. As the Monitor began firing her two cannon, the noise inside the turret became almost unbearable. Several members of the gun crew were knocked senseless when shells from the Virginia's broadside exploded against the outside of the turret. But the shell fire from the Virginia, which had proved so devastating against the wooden Union ships the day before, barely dented the Monitor's iron armor. Ironically, conventional solid cast iron cannonballs, which the Monitor's cannon fired, were more effective against armored warships, especially at close range. But because of concerns over the safety of her newly designed guns, the powder charges being used in the Monitor's cannon had been reduced by half. Shot after shot hit the Virginia's sloping sides and glanced off, apparently without causing significant damage. The strange battle raged on for more than four hours. Hampton Roads had become a vast arena, with crowds of cheering spectators on the water's edge, watching the two iron gladiators engaged in a slow-motion gunnery duel. With reloading times ranging between five and eight minutes per gun, salvos thundered out only intermittently. Neither one of them could fire very fast. There was a lot of dead silence in this battle for all the drama you see in the pictures. But these two wailed away at one another for hours. Their slow rate of fire wasn't the new ironclad's only problem. For these heavy lumbering ships, just getting into position was half the battle. Neither vessel was sufficiently powered to move its dense mass through the water. The Monitor's top speed was only six knots. The Virginia was capable of just five. They were underpowered. They were unreliable. Virginia's first day of operations had left her with a leak up forward. She sat very deep in the water. She maneuvered like a tank. It took 40 minutes for her to turn 180 degrees. It was awful. Despite her smaller size and shallower draft, the Monitor was also highly unwieldy. But she was practically nimble compared to the Virginia. Hampton Roads was almost a dance. I mean, the, the Merrimack would come out and the Monitor would dance around or would stay in shallow water. The Merrimack would steam back and forth and they would shout things at each other. Then, a little after noon, a shell from the Virginia exploded against the Monitor's pilot house, temporarily blinding her commander, Lieutenant Warden. Instinctively, the helmsman steered the Monitor toward shallow water where the Virginia could not follow giving Executive Officer Lieutenant S. Dana Green time to assume command and evaluate the situation. The Monitor's temporary withdrawal from the fight presented Lieutenant Jones and the Virginia with a golden opportunity to finally finish off the Minnesota. But it also gave him a chance to take his badly leaking vessel back to Norfolk and out of harm's way. With the tide going out again and his ammunition supply nearly exhausted, Jones chose the safer option. The Monitor fired a few shots at the departing Virginia, but did not give chase. The Monitor's mission had been to protect the Minnesota and her consorts, not to pursue the Virginia into enemy-held waters. Although in tactical terms, the first battle between ironclads had been a draw, the Union had achieved a strategic victory. Thanks to the Monitor, the Federal squadron at Hampton Roads had been saved. The lessons of the past two days were obvious and far-reaching. Conventional warships, their days were over. There was no more usefulness for a wooden warship. Although both North and South began making plans for a rematch between the ironclads soon after the battle, it was not to be. The Virginia, by far the more seriously damaged of the two, was laid up in dry dock for repairs. Then in May, the Confederate forces position at Norfolk became untenable and they were forced to abandon the naval yard they had captured just over a year before. For the second time in her lifetime, the former Merrimack was blown up and sunk. She would not rise again. The vessel that was built to destroy the Virginia outlived her by a mere seven months. On December 30th, while being towed around Cape Hatteras during a storm, the Monitor foundered and sank, 
taking down 16 of her officers and men. Even before the Battle of Hampton Roads, the North and South had redoubled their efforts to build new ironclads. For the most part, the Union continued to build bigger and more powerful monitor-type ships for coastal operations. But on the rivers and inland waters, an entirely different breed of armored vessel was needed. And it was here that the Confederacy again combined bare-knuckles expediency and sheer audacity to produce a makeshift ironclad navy that would bedevil the efforts of even the Union's most experienced naval commanders. In the spring of 1862, a hastily assembled Union riverboat navy began moving downstream to unite with a large fleet of seagoing wooden ships, commanded by Union flag officer David Glasgow Farragut, steaming upstream from the port of New Orleans. The objective of these two very different naval forces was to extend the federal blockade to the interior of the Confederacy, thereby crippling its ability to fight and cutting its territory in half. Among the hardest working vessels in the Union Riverboat Navy were seven ironclad gunboats built by James Buchanan Eads, a self-taught engineer from St. Louis. Eads gunboats were powered by a center paddle wheel. Their turtleback casements were armed with 13 heavy guns and protected by two and a half inches of iron plate. Despite their relatively light armor, these hastily built, slow-moving ironclads were instrumental in helping Union forces to push past Confederate forces as they advanced downriver from early 1862 through the summer of 1863. There were wooden ships with armored casemates or armored houses sitting on them, and they were effective in river warfare. They were very effective. Uh, they were not as heavily armored as uh, the Confederate ironclads, but they stood up fairly well against uh, uh, artillery fire. In response to the threat posed by the Union Navy, the Confederates built a number of ironclads themselves. Plagued by critical shortages of iron, machinery, and skilled workmen, however, they were unable to match the phenomenal output and quick construction times of Union shipyards, like those belonging to James Eads. Nevertheless, the few Confederate ironclads that were completed proved to be formidable opponents. No one learned this lesson better than Fleet Commander Farragut. In April 1862, Farragut's wooden ships had stormed past the Confederate defenses at the mouth of the Mississippi and captured the city of New Orleans. Farragut's brilliantly conceived attack, however, had briefly been disrupted by a small cigar-shaped ironclad called the CSS Manassas. The little ironclad managed to ram three of his ships before broadsides from two Union ships sent her to the bottom of the Gulf. Within two months of his victory in New Orleans, Farragut had taken his deep water ships upstream to a point just above Vicksburg, Mississippi, a city of such strategic importance and formidable defenses that Confederate President Jefferson Davis called it the Gibraltar of the South. Here they united with the Union riverboats, which were under the command of Commodore Charles Davis. The combined Union fleet then joined with a land army under the command of General Ulysses S. Grant to menace the city. Early one morning in mid-July, a powerful Confederate ironclad named the CSS Arkansas made a bold run through Farragut's fleet. For 30 incredible minutes, the Arkansas ran the gauntlet of Union ships as thousands of citizens and soldiers at Vicksburg lined the banks jeering, Farragut's ships unleashed their broadsides at the enemy ironclad. Most of the shots glanced off her armor. But at least two shells from Farragut's flagship, the Hartford, caused significant damage and loss of life. Nevertheless, the Confederate ram plowed through to the end of the line, retiring under the safety of Vicksburg's guns. Farragut, who came out on deck still wearing his nightshirt to watch the battle, said he couldn't help but admire the bravery and gallantry of the enemy. It was terribly embarrassing. He got a, almost a reprimand from the uh, Secretary of the Navy. Farragut was an old sailor, and he abhorred the idea of bringing in these new machines of war. His idea was for two sloops to get out and slug it, slug it with all they had. 
At Vicksburg, Farragut learned to respect ironclads. During the Mississippi campaign, ironclads proved to be invaluable to both North and South, not only for their superiority over wooden ships, but for their effectiveness against enemy forts. But none of the fortifications on the Mississippi River could compare with the so-called Ring of Fire that protected Charleston, South Carolina. In addition to Fort Sumter, which had become a powerful symbol of Southern insurrection, the city's coastal defenses included well over 100 gun installations and no less than half a dozen heavily reinforced fortresses. Emboldened by the prior successes of their ironclads, however, the Union Navy Department approved a plan to take Charleston entirely by sea in a bold attack that relied solely upon the firepower of nine new armored vessels. On April 7, 1863, Rear Admiral Samuel F. DuPont led his squadron into position against the Confederate forts that ringed Charleston Harbor. With him were seven new, improved, Erickson-designed monitor-type ironclads, one experimental double-turret ironclad called the Keokuk, and the USS New Ironsides, a more conventional broadside ironclad warship which carried 16 guns and was powered by sails as well as steam. The firing began a little after three in the afternoon. From the very start, it was clear that Compared to the Confederate fortresses, the Union ironclads with their slow rate of fire were severely outgunned. About 2,200 rounds would be fired and over 500 rounds would hit home against the ironclads. In response, the Federals would only be able to respond with about 150 to 160 rounds, all directed at Fort Sumter, doing some superficial damage to the fort, but nothing severe. Uh, the USS Keokuk will receive over 90 direct hits and be so disabled that she would limp out of action and sink the next day off Morris Island. Instead of proving the invulnerability of the Federal ironclads, DuPont's attack on Charleston illustrated their limitations and weaknesses. The result was a humiliating defeat for the Union Navy. The attack failed for a couple of reasons. One, the uh, monitors were untested and untried. The crews were essentially used to only being on wooden vessels, sailing vessels. They were not used to these ships at all. Plus, the Confederates had these buoys out, had their aiming markers ready, and knew exactly where to fire their rounds to strike as many hits as they did. One naval leader who closely studied the attack on Charleston was Admiral David Glasgow Farragut. The following year, Farragut would employ the lessons he learned when he led his fleet of ironclad and wooden ships into another well-defended southern stronghold called Mobile Bay, a place protected by impregnable fortresses, mine-infested waters, and one of the most formidable ironclads ever built by the Confederacy. On the morning of August 5, 1864, Admiral David Glasgow Farragut walked out on the deck of his flagship, the Hartford, to check the weather. It was the day of his planned attack on Mobile Bay, the last Confederate-held port on the Gulf of Mexico. And he wanted to make sure that every detail of his meticulously conceived strategy was falling into place. He had scheduled his attack for a morning, when the incoming tide would give extra speed to his ships, and the southwest wind would carry the smoke of battle into Fort Morgan, obscuring the vision of the crews manning its 18 heavy guns. It was this powerful fortress which posed the greatest challenge to entering the bay with his fleet of 14 wooden ships and four monitor-type ironclads. A red buoy near the entrance of the bay marked the beginning of another deadly menace, a triple line of underwater mines, which were then known as torpedoes. There was a narrow passage between the eastern end of the torpedo line and the beach, only about 50 yards wide, and this was where Farragut was going to have the fleet pass. Now, he was under a great deal of, of pressure at that point because he was going to come under the fire of 18 cannon from Fort Morgan, point blank. The Confederate strategy was to stop him before he got into the bay. If they could sink one or two of, of his lead vessels, the theory was the others would turn and go back out into the Gulf. 
Farragut planned to run his ships past the enemy fortifications, as he had done at New Orleans, with his four monitors ahead of the main column. His wooden ships would follow behind in pairs. The smaller gunboats would be lashed to the larger ships on the side that faced away from Fort Morgan, thus shielding them from the Confederate guns. To successfully storm Mobile Bay, Farragut knew he would need the concentrated broadsides of all his 24-gun wooden ships in addition to every ironclad he could get his hands on. The four monitor-type vessels in Farragut's fleet were greatly advanced from those used at Charleston and Hampton Roads, with improved turrets, better protected pilot houses, and more firepower. But Farragut still had reason to be anxious. Waiting just inside Mobile Bay was an equally aggressive and experienced naval leader, Confederate Admiral Franklin Buchanan the former commander of the Virginia. Two years earlier, Buchanan's ironclad had come within a hair's breadth of annihilating the Union squadron at Hampton Roads. Now he was in command of a much more powerful Confederate ironclad, the Tennessee, which was protected by six inches of iron armor and mounted six heavy guns. Although the rest of his squadron consisted only of three small gunboats, Buchanan fervently believed that the Tennessee alone was a match for Farragut's entire fleet. Just after seven o'clock, the Union ironclads entered the channel, steaming in a line ahead of the pairs of wooden ships. Because she was equipped with a device designed to push torpedoes safely away from her bow, the Brooklyn led the column of wooden ships. The Hartford, with the gunboat Metacomet lashed to her sheltered side, was second in line. Farragut was in his usual place during battle, high up in the rigging of the Hartford where his view was unobstructed, shouting down orders to his captain. The Tecumseh, the first monitor to come abreast of Fort Morgan, fired the initial shots. The Confederate guns opened fire on the monitors and then engaged the wooden ships as they came within range. Suddenly, Captain Tunis Craven, commander of the Tecumseh, spotted the black menacing shape of the Tennessee steaming into a bend in the channel just on the other side of the minefield. Here's the torpedo line. Here's the fort. Here's the open space that Craven was meant to go through. But when he looked at it, he determined that it would be impossible for him to turn the Tecumseh and engage the Tennessee uh, in doing that. So he gave his pilot the command, cross the torpedo field, engage the ram, hold your fire until the two vessels touch. As the Tecumseh crossed, one of the torpedoes exploded and blew a hole in the bottom. She turned, knifed, went to the bottom. Of the 115 crewmen, 21 were saved, 21 survived, and 94 perished. Those 94 bodies are in it today. Confused by the sudden sinking, the Brooklyn's commander stopped his ship, blocking the channel. With the guns of Fort Morgan and the Confederate squadron thundering away, Farragut's line of ships began to stack up behind the Brooklyn. Now the only way to enter the bay was to steam around the Brooklyn, right through the minefield. At this critical moment, with the fate of his entire fleet hanging in the balance, Farragut shouted out the command that would become a legend. Although the exact wording of Farragut's orders is unknown, historians would later record them as, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. Blocked in front by the Brooklyn, blocked in back by the Richmond, receiving fire from the Confederate fleet and from Fort Morgan, men were falling on the deck, something had to be done and done quick. So. He said, pilot, go on. The order was go on. Damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. Did not surface until, oh, Farragut had been dead a number of years. The Hartford and her escort then plowed through the minefield. And although she struck several mines, they all proved to be duds. The rest of Farragut's ships followed, each making it safely through the minefield only to be attacked one by one by the Tennessee and her escorts. 
Franklin Buchanan did the only thing he could do, which was he immediately attacked the Union fleet. And he did fairly well for a while. Before long, however, the Confederate gunboats were all knocked out of the action. Now, inside the bay, out of range of Fort Morgan's guns, the battle boiled down to one ship against 17. First, the wooden Union ships closed in on the Tennessee. Shot after shot clanged off her armored casement. One ship after another rammed the iron monster, each time doing far more damage to itself than it inflicted. Then the monitors took their turn. The Manhattan trained its 15-inch guns on the Tennessee and through a curtain of black smoke, a 440-pound solid steel projectile crashed through five inches of iron plate and two feet of wood. Solid shot from the Chickasaw rang against the Tennessee's casement, like giant hammers against an animal, jamming her gun port shutters closed one by one, killing men and breaking Buchanan's leg. When the Chickasaw shot away the exposed chains that operated the Tennessee's rudder, the Confederate ironclad lost all her ability to fight. Unable to steer and unable to fire a single gun, there was only one thing left for Buchanan to do, surrender. The Battle of Mobile Bay was the beginning of the end for the South. Other Confederate ironclads would make their presence felt on southern rivers. Ironclads such as the CSS Albemarle, which threatened Union control of North Carolina's inland waterways until she was finally sunk in October of 1864. And as late as 1865, a pair of Confederate ironclads would still be operating near Hampton Roads. But the spark of hope that had been ignited by the Confederacy's expedient and resourceful use of iron armor was flickering out. The Union monitors with their innovative turrets and heavier guns had proven to be superior to the makeshift Confederate ironclads. It was a fact that wasn't lost on the world's other naval powers. Within a few decades, masts and broadsides on warships around the globe would virtually disappear in favor of smokestacks and turrets. The move from ships of the line like the HMS Victory toward modern battleships like the HMS Dreadnought had begun. And it all started with a little Union ironclad called the Monitor. For all of the inadequacies of the ironclads, technologically, militarily, in the popular mind, this was the wonder weapon. They were probably the equivalent of uh, UFOs today. People had never seen anything like it. These belching monsters, smoke coming out of the strangest places, no sails, no masts, uh, things turning, guns firing out of dark holes. They looked like nothing ever before and they caught the imagination. With a single battle, the ironclads ended the centuries-old rule of wooden warships and ushered in a new era of naval warfare. Ponderous, powerful, and bizarre, they were, in many ways, the most revolutionary vessels that ever took to the water.